Alrighty, well, it is time for us to get started this evening, so good to see everyone here. It is starting to get hot, just hotter than we're used to, I reckon, for uh, having gone through winter not that long ago, it seems like. I have a few announcements that I want to throw out there before we get started. Um, we are, uh, what, tonight and two more nights from... Uh, finishing up Proverbs and almost to our summer series, which is the first thing I want to mention. Uh, there are, um, the schedule is back on the back on the bulletin board for our summer series, so look, really looking forward to it. We're going to be looking at uh, questions that Jesus asked, and each uh, speaker is going to take a different question. And we have some really good speakers lined up as well, so excited for that. Uh, there are also these little brochures, essentially. They're like folded over. Um, those are to hand out to people to invite them to the summer series. So we have the one to post up there, but there's also the brochures to hand out. Uh, there's some of those out, and if we run out, they're not going to spread off more. So uh, grab some of those and invite people to that as well. I also want to mention, um, we have, uh, as has been mentioned, just want to keep putting this out there, on Sunday, June the 4th, uh, just to be looking ahead, we will be having uh, the contribution. Uh, that Sunday will be set aside for Brown Trail, uh, the preaching school there, and so we want to uh, keep that in mind, uh, plan for that as we're getting close to that. We'll have ladies' class in the morning at 10, at 10 o'clock, as always. We'll be looking at Romans chapter 6, 15 through 23. Romans chapter 6, 15 through 23. Looking forward to that study. And then, let me see, um, I believe Bunko has been scheduled. It's still a couple weeks out on the 25th. Uh, and then birthday anniversary is at the end of the month. But I think as beyond uh, those things, that's all that I have. Of course, we have a lengthy prayer list as well. I want to remember several folks. Um, I know the Blacks have been going through uh, some difficult times. Jimmy with his falls and, and Vicky with the surgery and stuff. I want to remember them especially. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Bill Wilson's passed away. Yes. His funeral will be tomorrow. Won't it? Yes, thank you. Do what? Tomorrow. At 2. Okay, yeah. Bill Wilson passed away recently. Um, his funeral will be tomorrow at 2, so we'll also remember that family. Uh, absolutely. Anything else that we need to mention in our announcements for this evening? All right, well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we will get into Proverbs. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are thankful for you in so many ways. We're thankful that you have given us life. We're thankful that you have blessed us far beyond what we need or deserve. But Father, one of the things that we're most thankful for is the fact that you have allowed us to know truth. You are the source of truth. You have Reveal to us what is truly real, what truly matters in this life. And in a world full of deception, full of pretense, full of falsehood, Father, so many are groping for truth, trying to find truth somewhere, and you have revealed it. And we can be confident in that, and that is something that is so beautiful. We thank you for that. We praise you for who you are and what you have done for us. And Father, we just ask that you would bless us with the opportunity to not only grow in our understanding of you and our service to you, but help others to understand what it means to be your servant. Father, we're mindful of many at this time who are suffering. We know that while our suffering here is not to be compared with what is to come, suffering is still suffering. And it's not only difficult, but it also can present many temptations. We pray for those who are going through that, that they may be strong, that they may uh, look to you for strength, that they may not become discouraged. Father, we're especially mindful of uh, Jimmy and Vicki as they've been having such a difficult time lately. We're mindful of the family of uh, Bill Wilson as well, and his passing father. So many others that we know of, and far more that we don't know of, Father, that uh, we just pray that you would uh, watch over them and that we may uh, find opportunities to help them however we can. Lord, we ask that you would please forgive us for our sins. We're so thankful for this opportunity that we have to study this evening. We pray all this to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. All right. We are looking at, I guess you could say, another aspect of the tongue or speech, but not really. 
uh, we're looking very specifically at honesty and deception, both of which technically don't have to just be concerned with speech. We looked at a couple aspects of speech the last couple weeks, but uh, this is more, number one, something that comes from the heart, which we did talk about with speech, but uh, a very specific category and something that can be communicated by actions uh, and many other things as well. So we're going to look at that, and uh, again, I believe there are a few more Proverbs listed on the sheets in front of you than we might read word for word tonight because uh, there's a lot of overlap and so forth, but uh, we're going to hit the highlights of the uh, big ideas that we see as we go through. So let's start off in Proverbs 12 and verse 19. Proverbs 12 and verse 19. Whoever is wicked covets the spoil of evildoers, but the root of the righteous bears fruit. Wait, that's 12.12, not 12.19. Truthful lips, here we go. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Why? What is it that makes that true? He's essentially saying someone who is a liar isn't going to last. Someone who is truthful is going to last. What makes that true? As with many things stated in Proverbs, right, we can look around the world and see this doesn't always seem to be true. Okay, good. <laughs> I think about a house of cards, right? Typically, if you're building a house of cards, you build it in a pyramid. Well, telling lies kind of turns into a house of cards, which also seems to kind of be a pyramid scheme. Ironic there. But <laughs> basically, the idea is it's unsustainable. Eventually, you have to stop. It all comes crashing down. I think really, if we want to look at this, the answer ultimately to this question is just a couple verses down in verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But those who act faithfully are his delight. There are a lot of things based on how God has designed the world, based on the truths that just are a part of everyday life and how life works, that kind of tell us exactly how things are going to go if we lie versus how things are going to go if we're truthful. But it all has its roots in the fact that one is an affront to God and one is pleasing to God. We might say, well, it doesn't seem like truthful lips endure forever. It doesn't seem like lying to a lying tongue is taken away in a moment. But ultimately, both of those things are true because of God's nature, not because of anything that man has control over. Let's look at 26 and verse 28. Proverbs 26 and verse 28. A lying tongue hates its victims. And a flattering mouth works ruin. Now, I want us to look at this passage very straightforward, right? It's just saying the lying tongue hates its victims. In other words, it, it causes harm. A flattering mouth works ruin. It causes harm. I want us to look at it in light of what we already looked at in a couple other Proverbs. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord. Here he's telling us a description of lying lips. Why does God hate lying? Okay. It's an abomination to him. He is uh, opposed to it. But why? Okay, because it's deceitful. What is Solomon telling us here in verse 28? Is there any reason here in this proverb that helps us understand why God hates lying? It hurts people. At the bottom line, and a lot of times uh, we, we gloss over this, maybe because we're just kind of assuming it, but we don't really focus on this. And people who aren't familiar with God and his word, uh, they miss it. Everything that God wants from us, everything that God asks of us, 
is for our own good. And when he tells us, don't do this, don't do that, it's because he knows we're going to be hurt if we go down that path. Why does God hate lying? Not because he's, you know, a prude or whatever, not because he's uh, trying to kill fun. He hates lying because it hurts us. And even though we don't know that all the time, he knows that and he doesn't want that to happen to us. Let's look at 30 verses 5 and 6. I think that's one of the main reasons we can see that God hates lying. But here, uh, again, this is not Agur, or this is not Solomon, this is Agur here in verse or chapter 30. But chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, a different wise man speaking here, we have the other side of why God hates lying. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. So we've seen that it's an abomination to God. We've seen one of the reasons why. Because it hurts people. It causes harm. Now I want us to even boil it down more. What is a lie? From verses 5 and 6. Notice he's really not talking about lying per se, except there at the end. If you do that, you'll be found a liar. But, but what is a lie in these verses? Okay, good. If God says something, what can we know about it? It's true. God is the very source of truth. His word is truth, right? We have that said in multiple different ways throughout scripture. God is the very essence, the very source of truth. Every word out of his mouth is truth. So falsehood, lies, deception, they are the opposite of God's nature. Not only do they cause harm because of how the world was made, but when we boil it down to it, it's the opposite of God's nature. Someone's even described it in a sense, and I don't know if we could take this too far perhaps, but at least as a, as a concept, I really like it. Think about how God created the world. How did God create the world? He spoke, right? The words from his mouth, not a literal mouth, of course, he's a spirit, but he spoke it was created. So when we lie, when we are dishonest, when we say something that is not actually as we say, we're essentially decreating, destroying something God created. If God spoke a new existence with the words of his mouth, with mouth which are all truth, and we are taking something that we know exists, but then changing it into something that does not exist, we're essentially fighting against the very act of creation that God used to put this world into existence. So, according to the source of truth, with a capital S, right? Dishonesty will only cause more harm to myself and others. That's not something that is always evident at the time, which is why he warns us of this. According to the source of truth, dishonesty will only cause more harm to myself and others. I would submit there is a reason why Satan, the adversary, the opposite of God, is described as the father of lies. While God is described as being the source of truth, every word out of his mouth being truth. What does Satan want to do? Well, he wants to hurt us. But God wants the best for us. Look at 17 and verse 4. As we continue on in this idea of honesty and deception. 17 and verse 4. An evildoer listens to wicked lips, and a liar gives ear to a mischievous, mischievous tongue, or mischievous tongue. I always want to say mischievous. Apparently that's not actually how you pronounce that, but I'm going to pronounce it that way anyway. What is the result here? So you have someone who is evil listening to evil lips. You have someone who is a liar listening to a tongue that essentially causes trouble, right? That's the word essentially that's there. What is the result? What is he describing here? I mean, the, the person who's doing evil is already evil. 
So it's not like a good person listens to wickedness and is becoming evil. That's not what's being described here, although certainly that can happen. What's Solomon describing? Okay. This is not, oh, I am an evil person. Maybe I'll listen to something good. Maybe I'll listen to something evil, right? This is essentially describing a, a cycle, a downward spiral even. If I am practicing evil, I'm going to want to listen to those who agree with me. Just like hopefully if I'm practicing good, I'm going to want to listen to those who are speaking good things. If I'm not, I'm going to try and listen to those who are going to give me bad advice, going to uh, put bad ideas in my mind, which is only going to lead me further down that path. You have this idea of good begetting good, if you will, evil begetting evil. Look at 23 verses 6 through 8. 23 verses 6 through 8. So we have this idea of those who are going down the wrong path, going further down it because they're listening to these ideas. Now we're going to take a specific example, I guess we could say. 23 verses 6 through 8. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy, or it might say whose eye is evil. I believe is, is a, another translation there. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. So what are we seeing here? Okay. Uh, yes, I think there is that comparison being made, but let's take this in a literal sense. Let's say you're literally going to eat the bread of someone who is stingy, whose eye is evil. Some might say who is a miser. He says, don't desire his delicacies. Well, and let, and for a second, let's, let's think of this in a literal sense. Like literally he's feeding you. For he is like one... Some say who is inwardly calculating, or some say uh, as, uh, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. That's another translation here. And says his heart is not with you. Even though he says eat and drink, his heart is not with you. Why? What, what are we seeing here? He's, he's buttering you up, but he's not looking out for your good. He's trying to use you as a pawn or something to do something he wants. Okay. He's deceiving you, right? That's the whole context. He's trying to put something that is very appealing. He's offering you something that seems desirable. And Solomon's saying, don't be fooled by this. This is, you are witnessing here in this kind of scenario, the art of deception. And you should recognize his motives are not what they appear to be. He's not doing this out of generosity of his heart. By very definition, this is a stingy person, right? A miser or someone who has an evil eye. This is not someone who has your best interest at heart. And yet it's so easy to fall victim to that. And all of a sudden, you wind up in a situation, whatever the exact circumstances might be, where, <laughs> oh, I wish I had never been there. I wish I would never participate in this because he did not have my best interests at heart. Look down a few verses in the same chapter to verses 26 through 28. We have yet another example of this type of thing. Verses 26 through 28 of chapter 23. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit. A seductress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the traitors or the unfaithful among mankind. So again, we're looking at a specific circumstance. What is the seductress offering here? What is the seductress offering? We'll go into more detail of this, of course, at the beginning of the book, especially in chapter 5. Okay, it's a path of no return. 
Is that how she portrays it? Just like the miser, right? The miser's feeding you this food. It looks amazing. It's delicacy, something you don't get to enjoy very often. Same thing here, offering you something that uh, in one way or another you don't have access to, something that is appealing, and, and yet it's deception. It's all a lie. What is actually real, what is actually true about what you're being presented with won't become evident until potentially it's too late unless you see the warning signs early on, which is exactly what Solomon is trying to provide us with. One more in this section. Let's look at 25 and verse 14. 25 and verse 14. I think this was the one I started laughing when I was reading this, and Liz was like, what's that funny? This one just always cracks me up. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he did not give. I know that around here we're not familiar with clouds and wind with no rain, but try to imagine that for a second, right? Clouds and wind with no rain. What is that? Literally, what, what? I see clouds, I see wind, but nothing ever happens. What is that? It's fake. It's, it seems to be promising something, right? I look outside, oh, it looks like it's going to rain. But nope. He's saying that's what it's like when someone basically says, I am giving, I will give a gift. But uh, he doesn't actually do it. He's all talk. I'll, I'll help you out with this. I'll, I'll give you this. I'll, I'll do this for you. Never happens. Never happens. It's an empty promise. It's deception. We have all these specific examples going back to the very beginning that we talked about, this idea of evil begetting evil. And here's what I think we see. We are constantly surrounded by deception. Now, let's face it, we really are. We're faced with deception when it comes to uh, a lot of just the, <laughs> oh, for crying out loud, we don't have to go any further than advertisements today, right? So many forms of deception in that. Oh, this is going to fix everything. This is going to fix your whole life. You need this. No, I don't. There are probably 0.5% of the things that are advertised as things I need that I actually need, right? Deception is everywhere. And of course, that's just, oh, give us your money. There's a whole lot more damaging forms of deception that we are constantly exposed to. The children today are constantly exposed to. We're constantly surrounded by deception. We must learn to recognize it. Honestly, I would submit that the vast majority of the book of Proverbs is designed around that principle right there. Solomon wants his son, his son who doesn't have experience, his son, his son who hasn't seen a lot of the world, he wants his son and anyone else who reads this book to learn to recognize evil, deception, things that can cause harm before it's too late. We're constantly surrounded by deception. We must learn to recognize it. All right, let's look at 14 and verse 5. Proverbs 14 and verse 5. These are also very similar, and that's why we group them together here. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. All right, this one is another straightforward one, right? Okay, they're a false witness, so they're telling lies. Well, okay, duh. If they're false, they're telling lies. If they're true, they're not telling lies. But I want us to get the context here, because I think we hear this term false witness a lot of times in Scripture, and we don't really think about what the context is. What context is a false witness in? Almost exclusively, when we hear this term, false witness in the Bible, what context are we talking about? Where do we see witnesses, even today? Court. Now, they wouldn't have a courtroom with a dude with a wig and a gavel or whatever, uh, as we think of in those kind of scenes. I know we don't have the wigs now, but... I think we should bring that back, guys. Anyway, but we don't have that kind of official setting all the time and how they would handle disputes back then, but, but they still had a lot of different, I guess, avenues for handling what essentially would be a legal dispute. And it 
wasn't hard to lie to get someone else in trouble. I mean, that's what happened to Jesus, isn't it? And he's not the only example we have. Think about Naboth in the vineyard. Several examples of false witnesses. It's easy. You don't have CSI and all that kind of stuff to find evidence and, and, and prove your case in court in the same way that we have today. A lot of times you just have to rely on people's word. And that puts a lot of power, for either good or bad, in the witness himself. Look at 25, same chapter. 14 and verse 25. A truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. So why does it matter whether or not someone is a true witness or not? It's as if someone asked Solomon that question before he penned this proverb. Why does it matter? Think about how many people, and this is a real thing, how many people have been sent to prison or even executed based on testimony that was later proven to be false. It happens more than we like to think. Some of it is a flaw in the justice system of our country or other countries, depending on what the case is, but a lot of times it's because someone lied. Whether they lied because they were paid off, whether they lied because they didn't like the person, stakes are high. We might say, well, I, I would never do it in that kind of situation. I would just do it to get someone just a little bit in trouble. Well, faithful and a little faithful and much. That's what God says. Look at 18 and verse 17. 18 and verse 17. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Have you all ever had that experience? I've had that experience many times, <laughs> and I'm always like, okay, am I just an idiot, or, like, am I gullible? Why, why did that sound so good? Because once I hear both sides, I'm like, how could I have thought the first one was right? There's no way. But that's, that's part of human nature. If you only hear one side of anything, you're going to side with that, that position. That's just human nature. Why does Solomon want us to know that, though? Why does Solomon emphasize that? Especially in this context we're looking at of false witnesses. Okay, good. He's trying, again, going back to this idea of recognizing deception. He's trying to get us to be discerning, to teach us how to recognize what is true and what is not. Don't automatically accept what you're told right off the bat. You know, this is something that uh, we don't want to be just strictly untrustworthy, never trusting anyone. That's not what we're suggesting here. But when it comes to something that's important, very rarely should you just take someone's word for it. Even if they're someone who's trustworthy. It's not that they're intentionally deceiving you necessarily, but they can make mistakes. Anyone can make mistakes. We need to learn how to be discerning, and that's something he's encouraging us here. One more in this section, 29 and verse 10. 29 and verse 10. Bloodthirsty men hate one who is blameless and seek the life of the upright. So why would someone be a false witness? We already talked about it a little bit. But a big part of it, again, I think of Naboth, not to mention Jesus himself. A big part of it is because evil people don't like good people. That is the nature of the world. And so we have to be aware of that. We can't be naive and assume that everyone's naturally going to be honest, that everyone's naturally going to have good intentions. Doesn't mean we need to be cynical. Doesn't mean we don't need to give people the benefit of the doubt, per se, but we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as Jesus himself said. So, false accusations are all too common. We must learn how to recognize them and respond. It's not enough just to recognize them, right? We have to figure out what to do. We have to be aware. The first step is knowing it's happening, but the stakes are high. Even think about the false accusations levied towards Christ or towards the Bible by skeptics and those who reject the word of God. 
We have to not only recognize when God's word is being attacked, we have to know how to respond. False, false accusations are all too common. We must learn how to recognize them and respond. Look at 17 and verse 8. Proverbs 17 and verse 8. A bribe is like a precious stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. All right, now hold on a second. Is Solomon complimenting the guy who takes bribes or, or gives bribes, rather? I mean, we want to say no, but what is he doing then? What is Solomon doing here? Okay. We don't get this as much in Proverbs. We get it more in Ecclesiastes. Proverbs typically is, this is how the world should work, right? These are the basic principles that underlie how the world should work. The righteous will be prosperous. The wicked will be punished. Those kinds of things. Well, that's true in the grand scheme of things. God is going to ensure that. But in the here and now, sometimes it doesn't seem that way. In Ecclesiastes, we get a lot of more of the almost devil's advocate side of that. Well, I've seen a lot of people who are evil who are prospering, a lot of good people who aren't prospering, right? So what do we have here? Solomon's telling us here in Proverbs, in this case, you know, if you, tell, or if you give bribes, rather, you're probably going to be successful in some ways, at least temporarily. Now, he's going to go on to clarify that in several other cases, but we have to keep in mind, again, that's the appeal. That's the deception here. Look at 21 and verse 6. 21 and verse 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. All right, so now we have the other side, right? Bribes, that's, that's something deceitful. Well, what happens if we gain through deceit? It's a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. I think this goes back to what I think it was Liz said a second ago about uh, building something up that is not sustainable. Eventually, it's going to all fall apart because it's built on an unstable foundation. Let's look at 23 verses 10 and 11. 23 verses 10 and 11. Do not remove an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong. He will plead their cause against you. Now, I don't want to take too much time with this, but I don't want us to miss the wording that Solomon uses here. First of all, let's understand a little bit of what he's describing. What is an ancient landmark? Contrary to how some have used this, this isn't like a monument or something like that to someone who's died. To something yeah, else. It's a boundary marker. Okay, good. This is the boundary marker set way back when Israel first settled the land of Canaan to show this is the inheritance of this family. This is the inheritance of this tribe. You would have these boundary markers set up to make that very clear. Well, this is a society that needs a lot of land and you can't watch all the land constantly. So how hard is it to go and move the boundary marker a little bit? So your side actually happens magically to be bigger the next time that people check it. That would happen quite frequently. So that's what he's describing here. He says, don't do that. Especially he says, don't enter the fields of the fatherless. Even if the man of the house in many cases had passed for whatever reason, the inheritance was still entrusted to the children, but it was a lot easier to take advantage of the situation and cheat them out of their inheritance uh, in, that, in that case. But notice what he says, for their redeemer is strong. He will plead their case against you. You remember the book of Ruth? Remember how she has land associated with Naomi and there's that whole family but she also kind of comes with that whole deal. A lot of times we skip over the land part of it because 
really we're focused on Ruth, and, and we should be. That's really the, the focus of the story. But but that idea of redeeming, redeeming something that belongs in your family, what Boaz does for Ruth, that's that same language that he's describing here. Except that we're not talking about a member of your physical family redeeming. He's saying God is the redeemer. God is the one who will plead the case against you. You might think there's no one to represent the person in court and you can push them around and and take whatever you want from them. No, no. They have a redeemer. And that tells us a lot. Even in the Old Testament, when a lot about God wasn't very clearly known, that tells us a lot about who God is. So, dishonest gain might bring me temporary prosperity, but it is never worth it to be an enemy of God. You know, Jesus said, what is a profit if you uh, gain the whole world but lose your own soul? In that context, I tend to think he's even not saying being lost eternally as much as just if you are the richest person in the world and you die, what has all that done for you? But how much more if you're the richest man in the world, the richest woman in the world, and you become an enemy of God? Even if you still have your life, what's that going to do for you? Dishonest gain might bring me temporary prosperity, but it's never worth it to be an enemy of God. All right, quickly, let's look at these last few verses. Chapter 18 and verse 11. A rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his imagination. Now, hold on a second. We're talking about a rich man. He actually does have wealth. This isn't a poor person in the gutter imagining they're rich. So what does imagination have to do with it? I think if you were to interview some of the richest people in the world, you will find that most of them think their money protects them from a whole lot of things. Now interview the people who used to be rich and aren't anymore. And how misplaced their confidence is or was in those riches to protect them. I think, you know, one of the easiest ones is in the 30s with the Great Depression, right? People who were extremely wealthy and all of a sudden, nothing. Imagination has everything to do with it. Because riches themselves can be lies if we misunderstand their true nature and their true purpose. 23 verses 4 and 5. Proverbs 23 verses 4 and 5. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it's gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings and flies like an eagle toward heaven. I really want someone just to like, you can do so much with CGI and animation now. I want someone just do that scene, like make that scene in a video. Just someone has all this money and all of a sudden it just sprouts wings and flies away. I love that image. But what is, he, what is he describing here? I mean, we already talked about the depression. I, I can't help but think of Job, too, right? Not that he was misplacing his trust in his wealth, but think about how quickly his wealth left him. The perfect storm, which seemed like a perfect set of coincidences. We know it wasn't a coincidence. But the perfect storm of events, one by one, every source of his wealth, gone. As the servant was still speaking, another came and said, as the servant was still singing, all at once, it was all gone. It doesn't offer any kind of stability. It doesn't offer offer any kind of protection. It seems like it is. There's so many things that can remove our wealth. And then we'll be left wondering what actually does matter, what actually is valuable. Because that wasn't. Last one, 27 and verse 20. Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, and never satisfied are the eyes of man. What does that mean? The first part is the places that the dead people go, right? 
They're never satisfied. There's always more dead coming in. But then he says, the eyes of man are never satisfied. What does that mean? It's never enough. You always want more. You think I get to this point, but you always want more. It's an illusion. It's deception. Inherently, money is so deceiving. We're going to talk more specifically about money, I believe, next week. But it's so deceiving. I think about a poem, my favorite poem uh, that was written a while back, where he essentially goes through every possible thing that we could find valuable in life and says, no, this is an illusion. It doesn't actually mean anything. And what he's left with is essentially what Solomon uh, ends with in Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments. So nothing is more deceptive than the idea that this world offers anything of lasting value. That ultimately is the core lie that Satan wants us to believe, is that this world actually offers something of lasting value. There's nothing here that will last. Nothing is more deceptive than the idea that this world offers anything of lasting value. We can tell all sorts of lies in our interactions with people. We can hear all sorts of lies in our interactions with people. But that's the biggest lie. Let's never buy into that one. Anything else before we close for tonight?